seven. So, I don't know how we get staff here. Do you have a sense of that, Jonathan? Yeah, they're on their way. So, hey, Leonard's uh, on the restroom break, so if there's anyone else, there's... Okay. So, I guess we're having a restroom break for no position. So, uh, <laughs> hey, Jonathan, go to me. ¿Cuál de ellos? Oh. Ojalá sea afortunado como tal. Mira, aquí tengo Es el orejito y greñido que está. Mm -hmm. I don't have them. It just, it just looks like it blocks up. My sister's on the country. I think I'm the only one who doesn't have it. But because it loves up so much, you can't really tell. But so when I put it in the ponytail, that's all. You have pictures of your parents? Yeah,
CAO review. There is no action taken. These are all pretty much discussion and information. Okay, so now we're back to our regular agenda and we have staff presentations. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as a board, President Quinn, we have our first staff presentation on the California School Dashboard and California Assessment of Student Progress for 2018 19. The last time we met on August the 30th, we had a California dashboard overview, and this time we will be looking at the new results, which was released in November, and individual school rating on those dashboard components. The two areas that we're going to focus on is our assessment from the state for ELA and math, and at the end we're going to review an academic plan to increase student achievement in those two areas. As a refresher, you may remember this graphic that we presented in August the 30th, and it's about the eight site priorities talking about how California is really focusing on these eight areas for all of their schools, both charter and public. We also discussed these priority areas. Some of them are things that the state will give you an accountability measure for. That's on the second column. Some of them will be things that we assess ourselves. So today what we're looking at is how the state is assessing us for student achievement, and you'll see that as number four, and we're having a very focused outlook on that state priority number four. When you see the dashboard, you're going to see an overview of all of our three schools at first, and you're going to notice different colors, and how the state has recalibrated. This is state dashboard version 2.0, 1.0 was not this friendly, is that the lowest color would be in red, the second level would be orange, <coughs> yellow, green, and then blue, so obviously the goal for all of our schools is to be at the green and the blue status. So overview, brief overview on that academic indicator, just the two areas for ACES, orange for English language arts, orange for math. For our accelerated schools, K-8, it would be yellow for English language arts and yellow for mathematics, and for high school, green for English language arts and orange for mathematics. So we're going to have, under the direction of Ms. Lenina Google, come and present now, all of our principals will be sharing with you why their schools might have gotten their school, uh, school colors, and Lenina is going to present two slides on a background, a little bit of background information on what you may be seeing within those four slides. So some background information um, that the principals are going to be providing, some uh, data for you. Um, you're going to see um, two slides per school, uh, four slides per school. On two of the slides, you'll see some longitudinal data for both ELA and for math and how students either um, per have progressed or grew. And on um, the other two slides, you'll see some student achievement levels that will focus on whether how the percentage of kids or the number of kids that met or exceeded um, the standards uh, in ELA and in math. Um, obviously, we want um, our levels one and two to be lower in percentages, and we want um, higher percentages in our levels three and four. Uh, and just some quick information, just so you know the numbers of students that have been tested in each grade. Um, we wanted to give you a perspective instead of just seeing percentages. We wanted to also give you some actual numbers. Um, so at ACES, the testing window is between April and June for um, the SBAC assessment for, for ELA and math. They tested 250 students in grades 3 through 6, and then you can see the, the breakdown what is, uh, by what grade. Is, what is SBAC? 
that is our, that's the test, smarter basically, balanced. The, the Smarter Balanced um, Consortium. But within that, um, you have your ELA and your math state assessments. Do we ever give them that information? Which is done, it's done. Um, so at ACES, they tested 250 students in ELA and in math. At TAF, the testing window is the same. They tested 602 students between, grade, between grades 3 through 8. And at Wallace, they tested for about two weeks, and that's because they only test 11th grade at the high school. So there's not as many grades and as many students to actually move through the... How many students do we have in 11th grade? So in 11th grade, they tested 90. Not my, not my question. How many students do we have in 11th grade? How many grade? students do we have current in 11th grade, Rebecca? I don't know the number off the top of my head, and I can vary. It's approximately 100 to 125. I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Okay. Just, okay, 93, we're missing some kids. That was last year. Okay. This is last year's information. I don't know if that was stated, but this is last year's information. We haven't moved into testing this year. Our windows are approximately around same the time. same time okay. um, for this particular um, year, but this is all last year's information. Yeah, we have uh, at the end of uh, in November we have 113. Okay. Students so this year. And we oh, we this, need yeah. to we need to ensure that we're testing um, at least 97 percent of our students at the very least. So. Um, and, and, provide you with these numbers for this upcoming testing, we hope we'll have that percentage as well so that you'll see the participation rates because that's also going to be part of the dashboard coming up. And thank you for the numbers, not just percentages. Absolutely. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. So we're going Thanks. to bring up the principals now and they're actually going to present their data and we'll start with pieces. Which, by the way, was having their LAUSD site yes. visit today. So be kind to Susan. Yes. <laughs> 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 she's ready. She's ready. Um, what you see is from 2015 all the way until 2018, and what we want to see is you have the four different bands with uh, the percentages, um, and over here we have standards um, that were not met um, all the way to um, standard, standard not met, nearly met, bench standard met, and then this is, these are the students that exceeded. So what we want to see is, because you see over here we have 35, 38% high numbers of not meeting the standard, and then as each year is going by, those numbers are decreasing because we want our students that are meeting and exceeding to go up. And then this is always, I always look at this as a student's kind of waiting in queue that we're working with to get them over to that <coughs> level, and then we want to maintain these students. Then, and this one, um, so that one was for English language arts. This is for mathematics. We see the same pattern. However, if you notice, this is definitely an area that we have identified. Um, the principals are going to talk about it, but mathematics was the area that we identified as an area of need, which is why our professional development is focusing on that, and we'll talk more about it. So I think that's the important piece about data is how are we using it and what are, what are we doing about it now that we know. This is case six. Yes. Oh, three six. Yes, and this okay. is the year um, that we moved in the middle of the school year, and then this is last year, and we added quite a bit of students, like about 100, 147 brand new students. You know, to see, brand that's new why it would be nice to have numbers as well yeah. as percentages. Oh, okay, to see the growth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. That's a question. Oh, I'm it. Um, so this is just kind of summarizing for English language arts. Um, what we're seeing is the growth um, of the students that are at standard met and standard um, exceeded, um, the two different levels. So this is just the top two levels, and so from 37%, we've gone up to 42.8%. Do we want it to go higher? Of course we do. Do we want to work on that and, and make it better? Um, we definitely do, but at least we're seeing that pattern in that growth. And I, you know, I want to pat, I'm going to pat myself on the back because it's really hard um, for us, I should say, be the team. When you add so many students, generally you'll see a decline in the, in the scores. And the first time we moved, I think Jonathan remembers that, uh, when we had Aces 1 and we moved and split into two sides, our scores took a dive. And it was a hard lesson to learn. And um, I'm just proud of the staff and everybody that helped to ensure that that didn't happen to our students, even with new kids coming in. Yeah. 
Okay, so that's for English language arts, and then for mathematics. Um, again, you see the growth, but again, it's pretty slow growth. So this is why mathematics is an area of focus uh, for us. I don't know if you have any questions. But I guess what I want to highlight is the trend, and the trend is going up, and that's an important thing to look at. Thank you. Do we have comparative data? Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> we we um, <laughs> want to discuss this trend, looking at how we're doing, but also comparative data with other organizations like ours, other nearby charter schools. Uh, we're getting to that towards the end. Um, so we'll have you'll, you'll be presenting that? Yes, we'll Thank have you. some comparative And data. just with our visit, now they, they were complimenting us because mm -hmm. compared to the resident schools, they were saying we were almost uh, twice. Our schools, <laughs> the, the other uh, LAUSD schools, right. we were. Yeah. About we want to look at that. I know. Great. I we know. want to see how nearby charters are doing too. Right. Thank you. How'd you visit go? So far, so good. It's not finished yet. Okay. <laughs> oh, you just got a break to come over here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. From <laughs> one hot seat to the next. Okay, <laughs> Tess. <laughs> So obviously we want to see the trend from um, 2015 and 16, uh, the trend going down. Uh, so you can see the number of, of far below basic students, or not far below, but not, uh, not, not, not met, not met uh, yeah. goes significantly down from the 2017-2018 data. Um, and then you also see the, uh, the students that, that met significantly higher from 2017. What, what happened between, you don't have to do a deep dive, but what happened between 16 and 17 that we were, you know... I think that, let's, let's, why don't we, when we get to the overall... Oh, okay, all right, fine. That's fine. That. Yeah. Give me data, all I want is more data. <laughs> <laughs> let's move to the next slide. Like and, a true page. And math, um, you know, I think that we... We have our 2015 data, we look at 2016, and then from 2016, 17, 18, you can see there's been um, a, a decrease in the number of uh, students that are not met. Uh, the students that met went up. Um, this is not as significant as English language arts, um, and we can talk a little, I'll, talk, I'll elaborate that a little bit while we get to the overall scores. Next slide. <coughs> so this is a good... So counterintuitive. <coughs> So this is a, a, a just a good graph because it shows the growth, right? It shows the growth. Uh, this is from 2015 to 2016. This is a year we had, um, I don't know if you guys remember at the board, the, the big turnovers at the school site. Oh, yeah, yeah, 50% yeah, or almost. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had my whole middle school right. basically yeah. depart. Yeah. Um, okay. So that was a really, that was a really <laughs> tough year. Um, so we've been building since 2016 our program. Um, and evolving our program, and I think uh, 2017 was really, I think, a year where we, you know, we bought new curriculum. Uh, we yeah, we yeah, bought yeah. new curriculum. We provide professional training in that curriculum. Uh, we really tried to be consistent across the school, making sure that all kids had, um, you know, access to standards, and that everybody receiving instruction from bell to bell. And I think that you, should, you see that growth, and we saw that. I think the dividend is paying in 2018. Next slide. And this is the same pattern you can see in math. You know, um, we had the big dip from the staff leaving. This is this is a really tough year. And um, and then from there we we've shown the growth built and back up. we yeah. built it back up. And we, we built it back up by by providing consistency um, in each of the classrooms. And you can see we still have many of the teachers from this year in middle school still with us yeah. moving into the 2018 and then moving into the 2019. It's nice to see each of the teachers grow because we know the most significant factor in growth is going to be the teacher, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we need to make sure that we are keeping and retaining good teachers and we're growing those teachers because you see the growth from year to year. You know, because when you bring on a teachers, usually the, the first year is really tough, right? Yeah. And so you got to work with them, and you got to improve. You got to provide the professional them, understand how to use the tools in front of them, and then over time, not only they become 
proficient at using those tools, they could start to differentiate a lot more for struggling learners at the school site. So you see that growth from, from that three year span. Okay, thank you. I know you're going to have to, uh, one of our board members is going to have to leave at one. Okay, so that we'll, I just wanted to, in case you were leaving, thank I you. just wanted people to go, why is So our next presenter is Ms. Rebecca Handel, who's our uh, Lower High School principal, and she's going to have a task ahead of her. She's presenting historic data, so this was not under her um, purview when she was principal. And what's unique about the high school data is that after eighth grade, our state does not require mandatory testing for ninth and tenth and twelfth graders, but you're only looking at one grade level, which is eleventh grade only, and sometimes that's not a really good snapshot of your whole school entirely, how they're performing. So we appreciate Dr. Queen's question about how many students we're looking at, and we're looking at about a hundred when we look at these percentages. So thank you, Ms. Handel. Okay. Um, what I would like to highlight is that 70% of our students at Wallace and Burke High School last year met our student standards. Um, we have our biggest population at Met, um, and we have also a large population at Exceeds. And of course, these are the kiddos right here that are on the cusp, right? This is our low-hanging fruit. And when we talk about our data in our classroom with our teachers um, in ELA, we're providing these intense interventions and conversations with these kiddos to, to really get them to do that critical thinking and analysis in the uh, literary context. These are our kiddos that we're providing even more intense wraparound um, support as we uh, work with our teachers and our um, and within our multi-tiered system of support and our student support progress team um, as they meet together. These are the ones that are critical, right? And we're putting our most effort here with these, these kiddos. And, and so you notice um, that we increased our scores from uh, two years ago to this year. And all of those can be seen. In fact, we're aiming to do the same, and that's where our laser focus is. Um, continuing to increase and celebrate the success in our ELA. Okay, <clears throat> what you see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We were laser focused for ELA. We're even more laser focused. And one of the things we have done, we have multiple layers of support for our students. We have adopted a new curriculum, um, as Dr. Quinn and I talked maybe a time or two ago, of college prep math, um, also called CPM. We adopted this curriculum um, 9 through 12 for all of our math classes, and this is a very uh, collaborative, exploratory approach to learning. The teachers are much more learning facilitators. Um, so this is a very rich opportunity for our students to work in math in real life situations, critical thinking, collaborating, building the bridges for each other, and of course our teacher facilitators pulling that, <coughs> pulling them all forward. Um, unfortunately, what you see is that over half of our kiddos um, are very much at risk, um, did not uh, did not meet expectations um, in both of these. And so here are our critical learners. So what did we do for our critical learners? We have built in um, uh, opportunities for credit recovery. So we have Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 classes that were letting them uh, were able to um, integrate their credit recovery um, and going through these classes during the day. In addition to their regular six classes, they're also able to recover credit from a uh, failed class from the year before. We also have almost every single one of our freshmen um, have one period a day or one period um, every other day um, for math support. Because what we have is iReady, and iReady we use as diagnostic, right? So we did baseline assessments. We're currently in the process of doing our midpoint progress monitoring of them. But we realized at the ninth grade level, our students needed a lot of support. So we have them in a math support class with a math teacher, and it's blended learning, right? So they spend some time on the computer, they spend some time with our construction, they spend some time independent or collaborating um, <coughs> that way, and they're building their skills. Um, and they're doing this deep work and heavy lifting while they're also um, in their uh, actual math class. So they actually have two classes for math. As freshmen, most of our freshmen do, and this is really supporting our most critical at-risk learners right now. And this is how we're working with the team. We uh, talk about data. Everything is all data because we always want to change our instructional practice to meet the needs of every single student in our classrooms. And again, our organizational focus, by the way, I know we've already put this on the slide, but our organizational focus is on math. So we're spending a lot of time um, with our teachers um, in math talking about best practices and strategies and really getting deep into how we can facilitate the learning. So this is a, an overview, right? So right now, this is we're back to English, and what a celebration, because what you're seeing is, um, 
an increase. I was going to say, I don't want to look at 2015, but from, tw <laughs> from 2015 over, and even from 2015, we went up, 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 up. We only have up to go. And that's, that's where we're focused, and that's where, uh, that's where our entire faculty commitment is. Um, exceeding expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we are. This is our critical area. We recognize it, we talk about it, we support it. Um, we don't have a month go by when we're not working together um, as a math department. We have a math coach, by the way, who is phenomenal. She's a 612 math coach. She goes in, she's been uh, meeting with our most at-risk students, uh, coming up with an action plan, how to be successful in math class, and she did that with them one on one and our teachers are very, very focused on supporting all of our students in math as well. So this number, we only have off to go. Why did it come down like that? Good question. Um, you know, this again is variable data, right? So we do not have that longitudinal data. And here I wasn't okay, but I can tell you next the next slide, mm -hmm. next year when I'm having this presentation, we're gonna celebrate that huge jump and I can answer that question for you next year. How many how many new students came into WAS? Oh. I mean, just at the 11th grade level? Because well, from ninth grade, <laughs> maybe didn't have the kind of preparation that our TAS students have. Then you don't have to answer yeah, that now, that's but that's something question. I'm very interested in. Self-reflection. Let me, let me okay. come back with that answer because that's important. Okay, thanks. Can I answer the question? Yeah. If, which, are you talking last year, this year, two years ago? Two. I don't know. You tell me. I'm a little yeah. Let's go to last year, the, uh, uh, which was the 17th and 18th year. Okay. There were 102 students who were eighth graders who went into ninth grade from TAS, and the balance about 30, 35, 40. It was a very light class, that's why we got behind, uh, of students from the outside, maybe 30 students. So okay, so that's, not, a, that's students, not the reason then. But that was ninth grade, that's not 11th grade. I get it, but and if so, you're get, getting into high school, yeah. but and now you, have a, you don't part. have the wherewithal to uh, you know, succeed at higher levels, then it, yes, I can correct. see it dropping and, off. And this year, uh, more, we took more out, outside students because we didn't have still enough. Okay, well, heads up. We'll, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. technology are we using to support our math training? Um, our math training for our students? For the, or the students, yeah. So the students are, I mean, if, if you, I mean, this is not just technology, right? Manipulatives are technology, all the tools that they have in the classroom are technology, um, but they're constantly um, using technology. And I, I like Khan Academy. Oh, yeah. Khan Academy. So we're, we are, uh, we're using our ready, right? And that's the skill building piece that the students have available to them. But of course, there's every opportunity for students to continue that support through you. Do we encourage it? Do we let them know that it's out there? Can I say to you, I have never personally had a conversation about Khan Academy, so that's something I'd like to take back and explore too. So yeah. to bring us back to the 11th grade data, one of the challenges and opportunities that we have is when you are at a smaller high school, sometimes the 11th grade results like this can depend on one or two teachers. So one or two sure. teachers' performance. So if you do some preliminary analysis and informal conversation, they will say that this was heavily based on an A teacher, the 30% to 70% dip. Okay. However, I wanted to move us forward. Thank you, Rebecca. We're going to be asking you to come back. One, one other question. I heard you say that we don't, we're not required to test 9th, 10th, 12th. Right. Is there a reason that we're not testing other than we don't have to? Yes. Thank you so much. It's because there's a shift at 8th grade Starting in high school, the shift is not now, You do you know the academics? The shift is now, how are you applying the academics? So the state has now come up with a new indicator. It's not just test results. It's called the college and career indicator on how are you applying this knowledge to other things. And in February, we've arranged an in-depth presentation and training for the board on what that college and career indicator means. So that's one of the reasons why they only test on 11. Because it's test, 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 how are you doing, and test, 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 and now it's how are you applying what you've learned. But isn't it, I mean, if you don't have data to see? We have data. The data that we're looking at is what the state has said you have to use. We have our own data that we would use to measure the ninth, 10th, 12th graders. So, Leonard, you brought us to that point. The question was, how are we doing comparing ourselves to other charter schools? Right. So, in order for us to have that conversation, I think the first conversation that's really important is, 
who are we comparing ourselves with? So before we compare ourselves with other charters, um, I did some research on how are we doing with other students um, throughout California and schools comparing ourselves to the similar demographics. So if you pay attention first to the dotted line, because the dotted line is what's unique here, the dotted line is how are the state students in California that have similar demographics to us performing on the English language arts test that we just saw. And then you're going to see three color-coded points. You're going to see the blue line at the bottom, which represents TAS. You'll see the green line, which represents ACES that our principals shared. And then now you see the orange line, which is what Rebecca Hansel presented at WAS. So a comparison of our students to similar students throughout the state and how they are performing in ELA. What's the ba where's the baseline for the other students? It is the dotted line, the dotted dashed line. Is it state low income? Yes. Okay. The full line are the students. That was ELA. Now you're taking a look at our map. So the dashed line would be state baseline in terms of similar demographics. And then you also see the blue has the green basis and the orange as our Wallace Annenberg High School. So we just shared a lot of data with you. And here are some summary points that we wanted to end with. One, you're seeing steady improvement in nearly all areas. Two, there's a positive trend in nearly all areas, meaning almost all areas, your arrow is going right. All of our schools in higher in English language arts compared to demographic profile at the state. And to give you numbers, ACES results indicated a positive trend in levels three and four. Mathematics, increase of 1.3% in levels three and four. TAS indicates a positive trend in ELA 10 percentages. Mathematics, there was a 2.5% increase. And WAS, you also saw a great trend, 4.9 students higher than last year's. And mathematics was 12.8% lower than last year's grade. So in summary, um, your first six months, your CAO and our staff analysis is now what do we do with all of this data? So the first was we have to continue what we're doing for ELA. ELA, we're seeing steady increases, so we just want to continue on that path for accelerating. And for our math, we're having an organizational spotlight on mathematics. One, because of the data that you saw, but also, too, we also know for this career conversation that we're having that mathematics is often a gateway to career and higher level math at colleges is often a gateway to career. So here are some of the steps that we're implementing as an organization for Spotlight on Mathematics, and who better to share with us what we're doing than the people um, who are actually helping us implement. So Francis is going to share a little bit about what we're doing on math assessment. Going back to the chart, though, we, we compare us to the state low income, but we, we don't have anything at the moment comparing us to the, our competition, if you will, like the Alliance and the... Not yet. We're getting to we that. We should do that, baby, because that's, that's really yeah. critical. And you can also understand that they didn't release this data until, what, 30 days ago, 20 days ago. So yeah. just un uncovering ours has been the work. We'll definitely have comps for you. Okay, so this is a, a this year. I first of all appreciate the, the, the spotlight on that because we really started the year um, taking the principles coming together and really breaking down our data at a really in depth level, um, and down to even the, the the averages of the number of points needed to grow to the next band level. Um, and so each of the principles broke down their data to understand how their data works at a very finite level, and we took that back to the staff. All of us took this back to the staff. And we analyzed that data both at each of the grade levels and as a school as a whole. And to get an average uh, growth of what we needed to ensure that we grew and that we had uh, the necessary elements to move forward. And so we really dug deep with that SBAC data. And then the next thing is we set goals. We set goals, an organizational goal on that data, and we set goals with each of the schools, and we went over the details of what we needed to do to include, to ensure that growth. 
and we provided the professional development and we created the year-long professional development calendar with the monitoring necessary to see that grow. And so that's kind of what we did at the beginning of the year and what we're doing ongoing. And to kind of piggyback on off of Francis number two, the instructional coaching in mathematics is taking place. Last year we hired um, Erica Eikenstein um, as our 6 through 12 um, math coach and she goes into the classroom, she supports with modeling and demonstration of lessons as well as supporting with professional development. Um, and she came in kind of mid last year. Um, Tony Herr is also um, an instructional coach that supports at the elementary levels, uh, she's not back there right now. Um, but she supports at the elementary levels um, at both ACES and at TAS. And she also does the in-classroom support and provides um, professional development as well. Um, both instructional coaches work in close proximity with the principals. Um, they attend the leadership meetings. Um, they're very ingrained in what's happening at the school site. Um, on various levels, um, and they also attend like instructional committee meetings, and they're, they're really serving as a valuable tool um, supporting our teachers. I've sat in on a couple of those planning meetings, and it's really quite high quality. It's like, and Susan's going to get into the professional development portion on how they how they've been supporting the faculty. Yeah. So kind of going on from uh, what Francis and Lanita are saying. Um, in order, yes, we've set goals, we have numbers, we know we got 50 points as a goal for each of the kids to, to move them up, but we need to support the teachers and equip them with uh, the teaching strategies that are going to be effective. And so um, the key word there is coordinated professional development and starting up at the top level with principals going through the professional development as if you were the teacher so that we're opening ourselves up to that learning, understanding what it's going to be like once we're actually working with the teachers. Um, the assistant principals, the instructional coaches, um, then the professional uh, development is uh, provided to the teachers. Um, and then we're part of that. The principals are there as the instructional leaders of the school to make sure that we're, you know, motivating them, knowing, you know, we went through this PD, we're with you, we're here to learn with you. Um, and we're here to monitor, I know that's the next number, <laughs> but have, being involved in the professional development itself is absolutely critical to principals monitoring what the implementation is. Yes, and we actually just um, last week and this week have done walkthroughs and we've already uh, been providing teachers with feedback all around this professional development um, and what we're seeing as far as academic discourse in the classroom, especially around the area of math, uh, mathematics. Um, so again, it's very systematic going all the way down. Number four. Was my number four? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, monitoring profiling, you, you talk about that. I, I mean, the first, before you're getting into the model, the first step is, is working to change the mindset of teachers about math. And we've talked about this at the board meeting. Um, and I'm very passionate. We have to start thinking in math as, um, as not just solving a problem and kind of moving on uh, or solving an algorithm. Because these, these are, they don't put it into their long-term memory. And start teaching concepts and start using academic language uh, in the classroom for kids to actually start using math and using it as a tool and applying it. And this is really what this professional development is all about. And monitoring that piece from the last professional development, teachers are now required to bring a piece back of the math talks. Um, and our last two professionals to the next professional development to share. And couple that with our own walkthroughs, both for the assistant principals and the instructional uh, coaches and for the principals and the feedback that we provide the teachers. Uh, we did our, our last walk, we did a walk with the CAO, and we'll continue to do that. And all, it's the job of all of us to monitor and provide feedback to the teachers and support them in this process. Because this is really a mindset change about math. And yes, it is a we want to move into a less of a fixed mindset and move into a growth mindset about math. So these are the three things, four things we're doing organizationally at all three of our schools. And as you noticed in the data for Wallace and Brook High School, there was another spotlight that we needed in that area. So the, um, Rebecca's going to present three things specific also to the high school that we're implementing in addition to these four steps. 
Um, so what I'd like to say is what uh, a word that I see over and over again here is new, new, new. And so it might not be in, in I ready, but I ready is new to us as well. But none of this, if not the, the type of administrators and teachers, none of us are new to this uh, profession. We might be new to this organization. Um, but I'm uh, so pleased to be working with, uh, we do have some younger, newer teachers. But when we're talking about our leadership, our site administrators, uh, the team that I'm working with, I'm so very happy and proud to be part of because we are coming with a, a lot of experience to support our students. We do have new curriculum. This curriculum is research-based and proven to be highly effective for our students, and that's why we um, opted to adopt it for our students with that. This introduction is uh, our, our I ready. Not only can we base on tests and prior to monitor and end of year assess um, and, and demonstrate some achievement that way, but this, when we're talking about um, the intervention program, it's adjusting to our students. Um, so we're still talking about the same skills that we're developing with them, but it might be uh, just presented differently to, to the master skill or their level. Um, and let's talk about this how we continue. Because this is uh, the backbone of what we're doing. We're continuing to accelerate our students for college and career. We are continuing our very robust and rich partnership with LA Trade Tech. Right now, we're offering Poli Sci. Um, so students are earning college credit as well as um, Gov Echo credit. Um, as seniors, they're, they're earning the Poli Sci credit. We also offer a business class, and it's the same model. Students are able to complete uh, uh, high school credit, uh, the credits for high school, and also um, earn college credit at the same time. I'm so very proud to say that we have worked so hard with uh, Jonathan Williams and Dr. Kwong, our assistant principal who's not here, to um, put everything in place for STEM Escalaris, which is an opportunity for engagement of an underserved population, urban underserved population, to um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, so that we can continue to lift all of our students and, and make sure that they're ready for the future. And when we talk about college and career, that's what we're talking about. So we're continuing to celebrate the very backbone of what makes Los Annabert High School with the uh, accelerated school so very powerful. Um, and when we talk about accelerating our students, that's, that's what we talk about. So with that, our board had a overview of our California dashboard on ELA and math. We talked about and shared with you data on why our test scores led to those status changes and colors. And then third, we summarized and also shared with you a plan, our, our academic preliminary plan, our first year moving forward for ELA and math. And with that, if, are there any questions or comments from the board for staff? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I uh, appreciate the, the work that um, our coaches are doing, that our staff is doing, and Lenita as well, um, as well as Grace. The, the leadership and the planning is really, really tremendous. Okay, so task governing board resolution authorizing the submission of charter renewal. Who's up on that? Well, so this is an action. Yeah, no, this is an action that we actually already taken in August. Uh, the issue was more the verbiage, so this is just for the record, kind of that you all know that we we'll, we have submitted uh, the charter to, and Francis can speak to the details to LAUSD uh, for their review. We had our initial what was intended a public hearing yesterday. Uh, the meeting was upsided by. Uh, local activists who were talking about homelessness and uh, the wealthy charter takeover of public school systems and the, the meeting came, to, it was adjourned before their action was taken. So we're in the pipe, we just wanted to make sure that we had the right language uh, incorporated into this statement for the board support. Will that meeting reoccur? They'll reschedule if they haven't already, uh, but they have the 72 hour notice requirement so it could take them time. The good news is, is they failed to act. All those charters that were in question, actually it's an affirmative action. So no action is a positive action. Yeah. That's weird. Okay, um, I have a question. Um, in terms of what we submitted, is that a draft? It is. Uh, we're in the process now. Of... So it's not the final? No. Okay. It is not. Because they will review it right. and 
again give us more right. questions. Again, yeah, that was that was the goal was just to get in under the timeline that would protect our appellate rights. Right. No, I, I understand that, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that was not the final draft. It is not. Okay. We're on third revision now. Thank you. And we're getting questions, and one of the things that we, the board is doing is attending to one of those requests, which is to, as I mentioned earlier, review and update the bylaws. Yeah. Okay. It's a back and forth process. Now yeah. Until, okay. Uh, until it goes to the board. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks. And that public hearing for the actual vote will likely be in January. So this has already passed and doesn't need action. No, we still want to make sure that the language that's used here. Um, I believe Susan's still here. No, she's not. I am. Oh, yeah, you are. They just want to make sure that the lead petitioner, uh, the person that's in charge of uh, fiscal responsibility for the school, and that the principal is identified on the resolution. So those were the things that the other one didn't identify. So I'm the lead petitioner, Francis, the principal. And obviously, David today is our CFO, and not for long. <laughs> okay, so, so I so in. move. Well, this is a yes. Julie move. There's a second. I'll second. Any questions or discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Assembly Bill 699. What, you got one? <laughs> So we just wanted to make sure that the board is aware of um, Assembly Bill 699, which um, it protects undocumented immigrants from discrimination by the federal government. So we just wanted to make sure that you are all aware that we do have this policy in place. Um, and immigration enforcement threats have led immigration families to ask whether it's safe to even send their kids to school. So we wanted to make sure that we have a policy that ensures our families and our students that it is a safe space. Um, to come into school here, and we are required actually to provide a free and appropriate education to any and all students, regardless of their immigration status. So, um, the policy, uh, the tax laws, ACES policy, it includes um, how, to gather, how to gather and handle student information, family information, how we're sharing that information. Um, if any requests come in uh, by an immigration enforcement um, agents, what is the process? What do we do when they come in and ask to see certain documents or ask to pull a student? Um, how do we respond to any hate crimes or bullying as it relates to immigration, Im immigrants? Um, what to do if um, an officer actually comes into your school, which I said, and what to do if um, they request personal information um, regarding any student or his or her family. <coughs> So, um, so Lanita, is this a standalone policy, or is this included in the safety plan? Because having read the hundred million pages of the safety plan, much of this is embedded in it, but not specific to immigrant students. Right. This is a standalone policy that okay. we had to adopt via Plyer versus Doe and whatnot, and it okay. had to be um, modeled after this particular book, prompting a safe and secure learning environment. Okay. So this is a standalone um, document. That we've adopted. Okay, thank you. So this was for information, or just this is just for information. You guys have already approved the actual. That's policy. what I thought. Yeah. Yes. This was just for information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We move to staff consent items, and the reason that we're moving to staff consent items, um, rather than looking at each of these individual um, issues, is first of all, these have been on the web for a number of months. So we anticipate that um, our board and the public will have had the opportunity to take a look over the last couple of months since August um, at, uh, to take a look at some of these issues. And so that is why we're doing consent items. First of all, uh, to move the agenda ahead on issues that we've already touched on. Secondly, to, um, and those of you who went on the web, we do have um, an executive summary of staff consent items that is provided for you um, and what is included in those. And if anyone in, on the board has an issue and wants to pull any of those um, staff consent items, uh, let me know now and we'll, we'll pull those as individual items. <coughs> 
ready to take an action? Yep. Okay, so um, hearing none, um, our, I need a motion for approving. So moved. Okay. Okay, second. Discussion or questions? Okay, just so you know, I read that safety plan. It is comprehensive and it would be really good to have tabs. I know it has a you know contents, but if I were looking at this in a notebook, I want I would want tabs on that so that I could get to the areas more easily. It's it's robust, it's complete, it's um, quite detailed with scenarios for everything I think that could possibly happen. So um, all those in favor of passing all of these consent items, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Consent items passed. Thank you. All right, we're moving over to finance, and <laughs> this will be your last major, major deal. Even though know, I planned to do three hours. We'll go fast or quick or okay, however yeah. we normally do. So the first one is that we need the approval because this has to go out to the controller's office, LHD, and everything by December 15th. This is the independent uh, audit, financial audit. Uh, I put in, in the book, is, well, me I put it in. Uh, the independent auditor report, independent auditor report, basically says that our financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects. Financial vision of the school as of uh, June 30th, 2018. Next is. Do we need to say any more about that? Well, okay, so do we need to approve that? Yes. Okay. Uh, j just so you know, they go through, there's no audit findings, and no problems with internal control, and it's just sheets of paper. Okay, so, so no it's, a it's a clean, clean report. report. Okay, so I need a motion to... So move. Okay. Second. All right. Discussion questions? Okay, all those in favor of approving the audit draft for year ended? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes. Thank you. All right, hit it. Next, the <coughs> end of October 31st. One right. thing we did is there's a new uh, county standard update, 2016-14. Uh, that changes significantly the financial presentations for nonprofits. Uh, we've implemented it. If uh, you go online, it's not in the book. If you go online, you'll see that uh, we have functional expenses now broken out in four months and what we project for the year for each school and combined. We also, in the past, they had funds, they were unrestricted, temporarily restricted, or permanently. They changed the destination to with and without donor restrictions. So if you go on the statement financial position online, uh, you'll see that we've broken up those categories. Donor? Don't with, a, with donor and without donor okay. restriction. Okay. The board is separate. The board is not donor restriction. It's, but you'll, you'll see the set aside. Uh, now on to where we're at. Uh, Are we still on number two? Yes. Okay. We're still on the, 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 the uh, financial statements. Uh, the budget variance is a deficit, is a negative variance of over half a million dollars made up of a couple of components. One is the revenue. Revenue is uh, down because of under normal and task. They've made an effort to get back and they, they've made progress uh, in the first month or so, but they're going to end the year with a deficit compared to the budget. The second area is expenses are higher by over $400,000 than estimated, primarily because of special education and the issues with that. We, we uh, met, we, I met with Dr. Baines and with Francis, we took a lot of actions. We've cut a lot of the expenditures for outside by hiring our own internal uh, staff uh, for different components. And we're looking to see how we can expand that. So going forward, how we can have staff to provide better services to the students. Which would decrease um, 
our use of direct ed. It would decrease, might not say, but, but we feel the benefit to the students will be there because we're all full-time people. Okay. Have we um, used this information to, for our budgeting for next year? Well, the budget for next year will start being developed in January, February. We have budgets, but they right. were developed before. So we have to do three-year budgets. So the three-year budget really doesn't reflect the real costs that we... Well, we're hoping through knowledge to be able... We can't go backwards. No. But going forwards to intervene and not have the, the deficits we project. Uh, we've taken steps. So one step we took was... In the first week of school, we saw we were under enrolled. One was Taz, one was Wallace. Uh, we had a lot more students who found that Wallace who didn't return, or eighth graders who didn't matriculate into the ninth grade. And the administrators took immediate action. And that probably saved the school half a million dollars by the immediate action. So we had the data, and we acted on the data. And so th that was a benefit uh, to what happened. It would have been worse. Uh, the other benefit, too, was meal applications, working with the administrators, and especially Gloria, because the high school is, is hard. It's hard to get high school kids to handle meal applications. But we got, ended up over 99%. Uh, with less than, uh, with seven days to go, we had about 138 missing applications. We ended with, I forget what the number was, eight, eight or nine. nine. No, I, I was just saying that if special education is costing us that much more than we budgeted for, we need to relook at it. So part of it was, and hopefully this year will be better, it was the teacher hiring. We started the year missing special ed teachers. Uh, we had one teacher who quit, I think the week school started. Uh, we had one go on maternity leave. Uh, and so I think with Hiring before that will help because what was happening was. I want to be sure that the budget. You yeah, know, but what happened? We're not too optimistic about how much we'll save. Yes. We're required to do special ed. Yes. We federal. we can opt out, can't we? But then we no. lose. No, no, no. 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 That's a federal mandate. Where were we? Federal and state. Where were we? Uh, At one point, point, I thought you could opt out and just not, and you get less funding. That was an impact. How many special ed students do we have? What percent? About thirteen percent. Which is lower than a number of usually it's right around ballpark. fifteen to seventeen. Yeah. We're the ballpark. Well, so they're working. Okay. To answer your question, the expectation is that in the coming year we don't have. Yeah. We might have a deficit That's just because of need. We can't dictate need. We must take right. Regardless of cost. Yeah. But again, if we had our own teachers in place, we were spending uh, about five, six thousand a week for a teacher because the teacher who came in from direct ed couldn't case manage, and then we needed a case manager. So when you looked at it all together, it was double what our teachers would have cost. Just to be sure that we budgeted, yeah. yes. not too optimistically. No. Uh, now, realistically, yes, right. absolutely, yes. One thing we, we also looked at, of course, is in the numbers, and they're provided in here, is our <coughs> revenue was up. The revenue was up this year projected to be about 1.5, 1.6 million. Almost all from local control funding. We know that they've now hit the target. And so going forward, uh, the COLA predicted by FICMAP is 2.57%. So we know that, and we know also that our space is limited in the school. And so we don't have the drivers we might have had in the past for increased enrollment. I want to make sure this is separate from special education yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Right. I just because we rolled right into that. I just want yeah, that, to make sure right. everybody knows. Uh, the expenses, though, if we look up, are projected to be over 3 million, so 1.5, 1.6. Expenses of over 3 million. For the, if we compare our expenses projected for 18, 19 versus 15, 16, up $7 million, about 50%. So we have a steep line up on expenses, and we know that revenue is not going to follow oh, us. Right. And do we, do we have a plan yet for the, for the, for the um, real estate? 
Oh, yeah, so it's still underway. Hopefully, I'll hear back from them next week. Well, I mean, for the piece that we own. Oh, for the piece that we own, we talk? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we've looked at that. We've looked at it. It's only one car, so right. uh, if it's a two story, how many rooms we can get it. One of the hopes is whether we can't get it or we can't get it, to take the students and pass two and bring them back. It, it really is uh, better to be on our campus. Uh, from everyone's viewpoint. The students we where? Yes, too. Down the street. Our TK kinder students. We still have kids there? Yes. We have three kinder and one TK class. Oh my goodness. That's something I didn't know. So, and, and we're paying rent over there. Yep. Yeah, the rent isn't significant. The rent we're paying is 5000 but right. the state refunds to three quarters of it, so it's 1250 It isn't the cost. It's having the students on our campus. But there would be no increase in revenue. Uh, no increase in revenue. Yeah. But it, there might be some decrease because they also have a lot of staff. I mean, that would help to get really in for staff. Uh, but I, I think it would help parents too because a lot of kids have siblings. Mm -hmm. And it's much better to have it on the campus. Okay, we can do real estate metrics. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So if, if we look now at the four months, our revenue was up five hundred and seventy thousand, an increase of nine percent. Our expenses were up over a million. And and again, you're you're seeing going the other way. As we discussed on the budget, we know that whereas our revenue was much higher, it should, it will cross over at some point. And in the budget there's been no allowance made for the fluctuation in the stock market. So just as a reminder, uh, state income tax in California revenue is about two-thirds, and about half of that is the top one. So one-third one of state revenue is depending on the top 1% of earners, and a lot of what they get is the stock market. And, and a lot of money yeah, yeah. because of taxes. So okay. is that, that is, that, that's the overview of just be Is that number two? That's number two. Okay, so um, do I have a motion to approve the financial statements for the four so months? Moved. Okay. And then a uh, number three. Wait. Wait. I'm sorry. Questions? Discussion? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Who seconded that? I'll second it. Second. Scott did, I thought. <laughs> Okay. I don't know. Can can a president second things? I don't know. I probably could. All right. Uh, so all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Aye. All right. All right. Vincent will present the LASD first thing. Okay. Five minutes, babe. Five minutes. I'll do it two minutes. <laughs> so the um, interim report, as uh, illustrated in your packet and on the screen, are. It's pursuant to Ed Code uh, 4200. We have to present our, our financial projections and they certify our basically our solvency uh, for the year. What you see here is basically our estimates through the end of this uh, fiscal year, through June 30th, 2019. And um, again, it's just all basic um, projections based off of our four month financial actuals. It uh, reflects both unrestricted and restricted financials. Um, of funds uh, moving through the year. Um, the one important thing here, uh, and in your packets are the um, interim <coughs> you know, alternative form, which is a basically a simplified form, and all it does is just uh, reiterates our projections and our budgets uh, for the year uh, where our family. And these were there. on the web. Correct. Because I read them too. Yes, yes they are on the web. Didn't understand, but uh, <laughs> they're all numbers. As long as you understand revenue expenses and yeah, I got yeah, okay. Um, the important thing to note here for CAS, it, it does not include any of the wrong name costs associated with um, the property, as we mentioned earlier. Um, any um, additional expenses will obviously uh, have to be implemented or included into our next uh, round of projections, um, hopefully by the, um, the next board meeting. Okay. Um, so what you see here is basically the first interim reports as reported to the LAUSD um, this past month for all three schools and just our financial projections for the upcoming year. Okay, very good. Thank you, that was perfect. Five minutes. Less than, yeah. Less than, yes. yes. Okay, so do we need to approve this yes. as well? Yes, basically. Okay, um, I move that we approve the first interim report for ACES, TAS, and WAS. Second. Okay. Discussion questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passes. 
Great. Prop. Prop 39, information only. This is just um, to uh, report uh, where we're at as our expenditures in regards to our Prop 39 funds. It's based on our Clean Energy Act. Um, we've spent the majority of all the funds. Uh, the last major piece of item are the air chillers, which oh, hopefully, geez, yeah. which um, I believe Tom, spring um, break, spring break, and or summer, mm -hmm. depending on the um, scale and the complexity of the project. So again, this is just reporting where we're at as far as our popular name funds. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. There's just two percent items there. The uh, fiscal, fiscal policy, policy procedure manual. It's, it's exactly what we talked about before. We just didn't have a quorum. And on and the procurement, we made a change based on Donald Trump signing off that the micro went from thirty-five hundred to ten thousand, and the small which went up to I think two hundred fifty thousand. We raised it only to fifty thousand. Right. But the, was more detail on that last one. The procurement. So they have different buckets and right. things you have to do. So the micro with the least restrictions, you can just buy one from thirty five hundred to ten thousand. So we can we went with that. The small purchase you could go up to two hundred and fifty thousand. We went from twenty five thousand to fifty again to give us more flexibility. So but but yeah. I don't understand what um what the, those buttons are. So it, it's a so when we want to procure something, we, we want to, to purchase it. Yes. There, there's different steps you have to go through depending on. If it's a micro, <coughs> you always have to be fiscally responsible. Right. But if it's a micro, you don't have to go through, you don't have to go to three people. You don't have to right. do all that stuff. And the same with small purchases. So it gives us flexibility to implement things. We still can do as much as we want to do. But it doesn't bind us. So we, we, we can't go to three places. I thought that was just like a best practice and it wasn't in our, we didn't have that in our charter. Procurement. It's in the procurement policy. Procurement policy. Procurement policy. And that, which is a voluntary. Well, there's, there's amounts because this is the, uh, I think the defense, of, if you get federal money, which we do, that it, it just gives us the ability to purchase things quicker and not go through this formal. But are we required to have these thresholds? We're, we're, required, we're required to have thresholds. To, to prevent conflict of interest. Okay. So the, the non, basically the non-reporting and non-approval threshold is what number? The micro is 10,000. I'm sorry, because I, because of you discussed with the guy. Micro is 10,000, and the next level is? Small purchases can be made up, up to 50 in an informal process, in most cases where we see price quotes from an adequate number of sources, typically an adequate number is at least three, typically. <laughs> if it's over that, we got to go through a process where we're going to try to bid it out. You could have sole source supplier, which you're going to just go with it. They're the only ones you try to bid it out. And then, so over 50, the process is, you get a formal bid. A more, yeah, there's the formal one we're going to keep. <coughs> really, what we've done is. And do we have that in place now? We're voting on it. Do we, have we previously had that? Yeah, we had through the current policy, it was 25,000, 3,500 for the micro. What we've done is, typically, and it's been in areas, we'll say, Tom's area, we bid it out. Whatever the thing is. Because we want to save the money. But it doesn't require us to do that. That's the only thing. I understand. So there's something we've had in place, we're just changing the threshold. There you go. That's exactly it. All right, let's go. Okay, um, okay so um, those are the two consent items. And I'm going to move that we approve both of those um, in consent. Second. Um, questions or discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving those consent items? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, check, check. Okay. Somehow my black one does less. Like <laughs> That's right here. Where? Okay, we're all, we're all getting, you know, social before I've adjourned this meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I need a movement to adjourn. Oh, great. I move to adjourn. Okay. All right. All those in favor of adjourning. Okay. Any anyone to hang around even more? Okay. That passes. We're adjourned at one forty-four.
146. Okay. Thank you all very much for hanging in there with us. I uh, appreciate it. That was a lot of work to get through because we have to have forum, and I really appreciate all of our board members being here today to make sure that we can get all of this passed. Thank you very much. Any communication would you like or follow up with the uh, um, I'll give them a call. I'll give them a call. Uh, okay, as long as it doesn't constitute a serial conversation. <laughs> All right. Should I just say, should I just talk to you? Reach out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Yeah, definitely reach out. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.